Hey, welcome to Two Doctors Homestead. My name is Daniel, and today we're going to talk about preserving food at home. Two articles here that I'm going to reference throughout the video um, from World Health Organization, uh, Center for Disease Control, as well as multiple universities, agricultural departments such as Clemson EDU, University of Minnesota, uh, National Library of Medicine, um, IFAS, and a few other organizations. I'm not going to read the entire articles, but I just wanted to show this as the reference materials. I've been looking at the CDC guidance. Um, there's several factors to consider when you're preserving food, when you're storing food long term. Um, the first of that is the environment. Um, how's the food packed? Uh, where is the food stored? Um, you know, you have to consider things like uh, exposure to bugs, um, rodents, pests, anything like that. Um, you have the oxygen level of the container or the packaging the food's stored in. Um, you have the acid levels of the, the food itself. Uh, you have sugar content. Uh, you have salt content. Um, there's the temperature that the food's going to be stored at. And then you have your moisture content. So these are all important factors to consider when you're storing food long term. Um, and we're going to go into each one. We'll talk about each of the factors and, and what you need to keep in mind to ensure that your food is, is safe and nutritious when you're storing it. Now, moisture content uh, plays a key role in food preservation, um, whether your food is going to be safe to eat after you've preserved it, after you've removed it from the container. Um, the Clemson EDU actually has a great article on uh, moisture content in foods. Um, so I'll go ahead and read that here, just part of it which is food preservation me methods such as drying, freezing, adding salt or sugar work by lowering available moisture in foods. Moisture in foods occurs in two forms, water bound to ingredients in the food, such as protein, salt, and sugars, and free or unbound water that is available for microbial growth. Water activity, as AW, describes water available for microbial growth and ranges from zero, bone dry, to one, pure water, Water activity is controlled by removing water, drying or freezing, by adding salt and curing, by adding sugar, as in jams and jellies. Water activity is a good predictor of food safety and how long a food product will last on the shelf. So Clemson EDU has actually in the article provided a list of some of the normal moisture contents in common food products. Um, and I'm breaking it into a couple ranges here. You have uh, what we'd say is 0.91 and above or, or 0.6 and in the 0.91 and above range is, is really when you have to worry about things like botulism, salmonella, um, fibrosis, and some of the more nasty microorganisms that you would not want to ingest, right? So when we look at that category of what falls into 0.91 and above, um, you see things like uh, bread, um, chicken, beef, uh, cooked beef, raw beef, cooked chicken, raw chicken, apples, oranges, broccoli, uh, peppers, right? They're going to be something that you've got to um, really be aware of in terms of your available moisture. Um, the second category would be the 0.6 and above. And at 0.6 and above, um, you may not have some of the more nasty microorganisms, um, but that's where you're going to start looking at things like molds, um, yeast, uh, potentially staph growing in the foods. So in the point Six and above category, you have dried fruits, uh, whole milk powder, peanut butter, uh, cocoa, uh, jams and preserves, and then beef jerky. So below that, in the 0.5 or below category, um, you're less likely to have to worry about things like uh, uh, yeast, molds, botulism, right? And some of the foods they have listed here are noodles with 12% moisture, spices, whole egg powder, whole milk powder with 2 to 3 percent total moisture and dry soups. Um, one thing to note, um, and this is a common common theme throughout uh, the different articles and, and research, is that water activity cannot be measured at home, right? Just kind of get that out of the way, right? There are scientific instruments um, that are rather expensive that you could use to measure available moisture, um, but it's best to say you don't know right? I mean, there's some foods you can say, hey, this food is probably safe, this food is not safe, but don't, don't assume um, that you know in your, your available moisture. 
Now another article I wanted to point out on moisture content um, is for the International Rice Research Institute, um, and it's in uh, reference to research done on grain and air properties. Um, this states that rice is hydro hygroscopic. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Um, hygroscopic means that when uh, dry rice is exposed to air with high humidity, it will absorb water from the air. Um, when it's exposed to low humidity environments, it will release the water from the air. So overall, the moisture content um, of dry goods can be greatly impacted by the environment. Um, if you're in a high humid day, um, you're going to have more moisture, even in your driest goods, like a dry grain of rice. Um, so be aware that moisture content can fluctuate and um, is dependent on a lot of factors. Now, in looking at food preservation, there are a few things you can do to try to reduce the moisture content in your foods. So this is dehydrated beef jerky. So dehydrating it, um, if you're not familiar with the process, is essentially slow cooking it um, at appropriate temperatures and, and cooking, cooking the meat um, long and slow um, will help reduce the moisture, right? You're drying it out in the oven. Um, we've also added silica packs that once again help absorb extra moisture. Um, these are common silica packs. You can get them on Amazon. They're only a couple cents a piece. All right, another example of removing moisture from your foods is freeze-dried, right? You can get these, these cans of freeze-dried foods um, from a lot of places, Amazon, uh, maybe even at your grocery store. Um, the process of freeze-drying the food um, removes the moisture. That's the entire intent. Um, may not remove 100% of the moisture, but they're trying to remove as much moisture as possible when you freeze dry the food, um, which dramatically extends the shelf life, right? So this says right here, 10 years on this product. Um, if you have a freeze dry at home, if you can afford a freeze dryer, um, that's great. They're very expensive. They really are. The freeze dryers are, are expensive. Um, take a lot of energy to run, but if you want to store your the foods you have at home the foods from your garden as long as possible certainly freeze dryer is an option uh, if you don't if you can't afford that if you don't have that um, you could look at once again a dehydrator right dehydrate things like your jerky won't last as long um, by a long shot of anything that's freeze dried but it will help maintain um, the freshness and the, the safety of the foods for a longer period of time now this is something i packed in the last video we made about food preservation and this is just dry milk Right, dry milk in a canning jar uh, it was vacuum sealed and we did add a silica pack so the idea being once again let's um, control the environment right because it could absorb moisture from the environment so the canning jar controls the environment um, and uh, the silica pack will just help dry it out a little bit more now note this would be dry packing right um, there's another method known as dry canning Basically, dry canning is taking your dry goods like flour, putting it in a canning jar, and heating it up in the oven. I think the idea behind it is heating up will bake it out, maybe bake out the moisture. Um, there's a lot of research out there that says don't do that. What you're actually doing is you're increasing the moisture by releasing the total moisture and converting it to active moisture. Right? So you're actually making the products less safe. So I would not recommend dry canning. Um, do your own research. There's a lot of videos on that out there. Um, but dry packing, right? We're not heating it up. We're not putting it in the oven. Um, we're, we're storing the foods in a clean, sterile container. Um, shouldn't add any additional, right? Any additional risk that you might have with dry canning. Um, now, one of the other things we're going to talk about is oxygen levels. So you can increase your risk. Um, by removing the oxygen, but you can also um, remediate some of the risks. So it's very much oxygen is, is your friend of me. You know, you need it to survive. Um, removing the oxygen will clear a lot of things, but it can increase your risks. All right, next thing I want to talk about in food preservation is oxygen. Um, this can be a, a bit of a controversial topic, um, just based on some of the comments I've seen on my last videos. Um, but I want to look at two articles. We've got the University of Minnesota Extension about vacuum sealing food at home safely, as well as the National Library of Medicine. So in the University of Minnesota Extension article, 
Um, they talk about the benefits, great benefits, uh, revolution um, in food preservation um, as we develop the ability to vacuum seal foods or use oxygen absorbers to absorb oxygen in the packaging um, that can dramatically improve shelf life, removing the air. Oxygen will cause the food to degrade, um, cause fats to develop bad flavors. I'm just reading bits from the article. Um, there's a lot of things that oxygen does negatively, negatively impacts the food. So removing that oxygen will go a long way to help your preserved foods last longer. Um, there are risks on removing oxygen. Um, one of the risks, of course, is botulism. Botulism thrives in a low oxygen environment. So by removing the oxygen, you are increasing the risk of botulism. So it is something to be aware of. Uh, when you look at the National Library of Medicine, it says the preservation of packaged food against oxidative degradation is essential to establish and improve food shelf life, customer acceptability, and increased food security, right? And it talks a little bit about oxygen absorbers. So very important, very important to human food chain. Um, but they said, be aware, uh, there are a list of requirements for something like botulism to grow um, and one of those is a low oxygen environment so while you're preserving your food um, improving the uh, freshness and, and the shelf life um, you are increasing the risk of other things another option in vacuum sealing here is your classic freezer bag a lot of times we call them freezer bags this is holding beef jerky we vacuum sealed it once again to help maintain the freshness um, a lot of the times you'd say freezer bags for food storage are really more for things you're going to put in the freezer, right? They're not as good as, say, a Mylar bag or a mason jar um, for maintaining the airtight environment. In fact, a lot of mine end up leaking, leaking the air out. Um, but they're good for things you're going to put in the freezer, things you're going to show, st store short term, um, prevent uh, things like frostbite and, and moisture accumulation. So they do create a sealed environment for as long as they last. All right, and then looking at some of the ways to remove oxygen from your stored foods. In this case, we have a, a ball jar. Um, we have a, a milk powder in the jar, and we've actually used a, a food saver jar sealer um, on my vacuum sealer, right? And we attached it, and we vacuumed the air out. Um, that's one option for removing the air from your stored foods. Um, another one here is a Mylar bag, classic Mylar bag. Um, we put the oxygen absorber in the bag before we seal it. And as you can see, it's all sucked in. So that oxygen absorber removed the oxygen from the bag. Once again, we'll keep the food fresh longer. Um, but there are new and additional risks right, when you're creating that low oxygen environment. I want to talk about salt content. Salt has been used as a food preservative um, for a long time. You know, probably hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, things like salted pork. Uh, was a food staple back in the day. They would take uh, sometimes an entire pig and put it in a barrel full of salt to preserve it, and that, that would last for a while. Uh, I want to show this is a, a sausage that we made ourselves. This is a duck sausage that we cured. And then this is your standard <coughs> store-bought summer sausage. This has been professionally cured and packaged. Now, when you're looking at curing meat, um, the intent being to store it at room temperature, uh, you have to be very careful, right? You're, you're dealing with a low oxygen environment just because of the packaging. You're dealing with a room temperature environment. Um, so there's a lot of risk for things like botulism and whatnot to grow. Um, so you want to make sure you get your salt right. Uh, now this here is uh, curing salt, prog powder number one, curing salt number one. We have prog powder number two, curing salt number two. Um, and these... Uh, sodium nitrates, sodium nitrites, um, and they, they help in the curing process. Um, you're able to use uh, products like this to um, cure the meats uh, without using as much salt, right? So you're replacing that sodium uh, with sodium nitrate, sodium nitrites. Uh, just using straight salt to cure your meats. Um, I've heard numbers as high as 10% salt content. Um, that's probably going to be a little hard to eat. Right, uh, certainly with our, our palates now, 10% um, salt is a lot, right? So um, if you're going to cure meats, um, educate yourself, um, spend, spend time looking at the process, use proven recipes. Um, there can be a lot of risks, but those risks can be mitigated um, using the proper processes and, and ingredients.
I want to talk a little bit about sugar and acid pH levels as it relates to food preservation. I'm looking at an article from the World Health Organization. It says botulism will not grow in acidic conditions, uh, pH less than 4.6, right? So it says, therefore, toxins will not be formed in acidic foods. However, a low pH will not degrade any preformed toxin, which means if your food already has botulism toxins, lowering the pH, increasing the acidic level will not kill the toxins. So we'll get some common. This is really your common home canning, right? So here we have a jar of salsa we made from peppers and tomatoes from the garden. We have a, a watermelon jelly and a peach jam, right? We made these just from what we grew on the property on the homestead. Um, uh, jams, jellies, uh, canning is, is age old. It's an age old process of food preservation. Um, there are risks because you are creating a low oxygen environment. Um, you're storing them at room temperatures. Uh, you probably have a high moisture content. So in this case, we're, we're looking at uh, acidic, the, uh, uh, the pH level of the, the foods, as well as the sugar content to guarantee your safety to preserve the food. So I would recommend you follow an established recipe, right? Look for a recipe that tells you how to do it, what needs to go into it. Um, don't just guess, right? You've potentially been storing these for a long time, and there can be a lot of risk involved. So um, don't be afraid to make peach jam. As I said, don't, don't make up your own recipe, right? Follow an established, trusted recipe, and you should be fine. Now, when looking at the temperature um, and its impact on food, food preservation, there's really two areas to look at. First of all is what is a, a safe, safe temperature to store your food. Um, anything uh, below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, I've seen 37 degrees be used, or above 250 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which really means um, inside of an oven, right? You're cooking your food at that point. Hopefully your house isn't 250 degrees inside. Um, but that, that's where you're going to start killing any of the toxins. Um, that might might exist in the food. Um, if you're not storing below 40 or 37 or above 250 degrees, um, you're, you're at, uh, in, in kind of the danger zone, right? And that's when we look at some of the other factors for food preservation, like moisture content, salt and sugar and whatnot. Um, the second place to look at in food preservation is when you're talking about dry goods, you're talking about storing food at room temperatures, um, the temperature it's being stored at can have a dramatic impact on how long it will retain retain quality. And looking at once again Utah State University here, um, their studies show if you store between 40 and 70 degrees, um, you're more likely. You know they, they looked at wheat um, wheat storage at between 40 and 70 degrees maintain quality for 25 years. But when being stored in hotter areas like a garage or an attic, um, it really only retained quality for five years. So the, the difference can be dramatic based on the temperature um, you're storing your food, not only for um, health reasons, say room temperature versus refrigerator, um, but also um, in the longevity uh, of your stored goods. All right, thank you for sitting through the video. If you enjoyed, please like and subscribe. I um, fear this is going to be a long one. Um, but we did cover home food preservation. <clears throat> we talked about environmental impacts, oxygen, acid levels, sugar, salt, temperature, and moisture, as well as different um, techniques uh, for storing food. So thanks for watching the video and, and hope you enjoyed it.